Hey everyone, welcome to this part 107 study guide. My name is Brandon and I'll be walking you through the step-by-step -step process to getting your drone license and I'll be answering some of the most frequently asked questions surrounding the exam. If you're new to the industry, you've probably heard by now that you can make a career flying drones as a professional drone operator, which sounds crazy, right? Well, it's true and I'm gonna show you how to get started. So once you've chosen the right drone, it's important to figure out when, where, and what missions you can legally fly to avoid large fines and ensure safety. The license is called a remote pilot certificate, and it's provided by the Federal Aviation Administration under the Part 107 rule. Now I know that sounds complicated, so let's simplify this further, and we'll ask the question everyone's thinking right now. Do I need a drone license? The short answer is yes, and chances are if you've clicked on this video, you already know why. But if you're new to the industry and you're thinking about using your drone to make some additional income on the weekends or receive any type of monetary compensation for your drone work, you will need a license. The drone industry is huge and it's only getting bigger, which presents a great opportunity to anyone interested in turning their passion into a profitable drone business. Up until August 29th, 2016, the rules and regulations in the US were pretty unstructured in terms of legality of flying drones commercially. Since then, the FAA has made many strides in making flying drones legal and far safer. So let's get back to the good stuff. You've taken a look at the regulations and you need help passing the Part 107 exam. Let's take a look at what you need to qualify. So first, you must be at least 16 years old. You must be able to read, speak, write, and understand English. You must be in physical and mental condition to safely operate a drone. You must pass the initial knowledge exam at an FAA approved testing center. And you must be subscribed to our YouTube channel. Check all the boxes, great. Here's where the guide really starts. So to receive your license, you must pass a written knowledge test. We've been over that. Better known as the part 107 exam. This exam is a 60 question multiple choice test with three answers to choose from. You've got A, B, or C. Some questions will require you to reference airspace maps and weather charts that are provided to you by the FAA testing center. To pass, you must receive a score of 70% or better. In other words, you have to get 42 of the 60 questions right to become a certified pilot. Once you pass, the government will issue you a remote pilot certificate in the mail. Pretty cool, right? And yes, the license is valid in all 50 states. Now that you're familiar with the Part 107 exam, let's dive into how long it takes to get certified. The FAA recommends a minimum of 15 to 20 hours of studying. With that said, everyone learns differently, so be sure to go through this material at your own speed. I know you've put that amount of time into a big project or test at some point in your life, and I bet you didn't come out a certified drone pilot. So here's what it comes down to. Study, schedule, and pass. It's worth it. At this point, you may be wondering, where can I take the exam? So you'll take your in-person exam at an approved testing center in your area. There are over 700 locations in the United States, so chances are there's one down the street from you at a local airport or a private testing facility. You can find a list of resources and other free training materials in the description. There's a link to this entire course, including flashcards and quizzes to help you study. I've also included over 250 real FAA practice exam questions split into four tests where you can time yourself and there's other valuable information like text below the videos so you can read along and up-to-date lists of testing centers in your area. If you click the link in the description, you'll be able to access all of that material offline and on the go through my free app that's available in the App Store and Google Play. There is no reason you shouldn't pass first try. When you're ready to schedule the exam, the name of the actual test is called the Unmanned Aircraft General Small UAG. It's going to pop up right here. The testing fee is $150, and that's paid directly to the testing center. You'll do this on the phone or online when you register and schedule your exam. Once you pass, the license will be valid for two years, and you'll need to pass a recertification test every 24 months to maintain your license. 
Before we get started with the actual study guide, please be sure to click that subscribe button. I'll wait. Okay, thanks. Hunter and I put a lot of money, time, and effort into making this accessible for everyone. So thanks for hitting that like button and stay tuned for future content. Hey everyone, and welcome to this module on regulations and FAA standards. You're probably familiar with the term part 107, which stems from the not so common term, title 14 of the code of federal regulations, part 107. This set of rules and regulations outlines exactly what the FAA wants to ensure you demonstrate knowledge in as a remote pilot flying in the national airspace. In this chapter, we'll be reviewing the applicability of Title 14 Code of Federal Regulations to Part 107 Small Unmanned Aircraft Operations. We'll be going over the definitions used in Part 107, the ramifications of reproducing or altering a certificate, accident reporting, and lastly, inspection, testing, and compliance. Now that you understand the knowledge areas that Part 107 applies to, Let's go over what the Part 107 rule does not apply to. Model aircrafts meeting the following criteria are not covered in the Part 107 rule. Operations that are conducted outside of the United States, amateur rockets, balloons, kites, public aircrafts, and air carrier operations are not covered under the Part 107 rule. To start, these are the definitions that I would highly recommend pausing this video to get a good grasp of. All the definitions will likely be seen throughout the extent of the exam and play a large role in ensuring that you understand the various concepts being covered. So let's start with our first definition, control station, or CS. This is going to be the interface used by remote pilots or the person manipulating the controls to actually control the flight path of the small unmanned aircraft. Next, we have corrective lenses, which are actually just another word for spectacles or contact lenses. And the definition of a model aircraft is an unmanned aircraft that's capable of sustained flight in the atmosphere. Model aircrafts are flown within visual line of sight, or VLOS, of the person operating the aircraft, and they're flown for hobby or recreational purposes only. Now, the person manipulating the controls is someone other than the remote pilot in command that's controlling the flight of the SUAS. This person does not have to hold a remote pilot certificate, but must be supervised by someone who does hold one. For example, if you and your team were hired to do a complex mission for an agricultural firm, and you have a colleague that might be a better pilot than you for this specific mission, you can actually have them fly the mission while you oversee the operation. Now, remote pilot in command or remote pilot is a person who holds a remote pilot certificate and has the final authority and responsibility for the operation and the safety of an SUAS operation conducted under Part 107. A small unmanned aircraft, or UA, is an unmanned aircraft weighing less than 55 pounds, including everything that's on board or otherwise attached to the aircraft, and it can be flown without the possibility of direct human intervention from within or on the aircraft. To continue with the definitions used in Part 107, a small unmanned aircraft system, or SUAS, is an unmanned aircraft and its associated elements, including communications links and components that control the small UA that are required for the safe and efficient operation in the national airspace. An unmanned aircraft, or UA, is an aircraft operated without the possibility of direct human intervention from within or on the aircraft. Visual observer is a term that you're gonna be hearing me say a lot throughout this course. A VO is a person acting as a flight crew member who assists the remote pilot and the person manipulating the controls to see and avoid other air traffic that's either aloft or on the ground. 
Remember, the FAA relies on information provided by owners and remote pilots when it has to authorize operations or when it has to make a compliance determination. Accordingly, the FAA may take appropriate action against an SUAS owner or an operator, remote PIC or anyone else that provides false records or otherwise reproduces the information for fraudulent purposes. Are you a first time remote pilot or an existing Part 61 certificate holder? Well, if you're already a Part 61 pilot, all you have to do is go to the FAA's website and take the safety.gov course to become a certified remote pilot in command. Most of you don't have to worry about this. It only applies to a small group of individuals. Let's get into accident reporting, which is one of the first major topics on your exam. A remote pilot in command is required to report an accident to the FAA within 10 days. Accidents include serious injury to a person or any loss of consciousness. An injury would be considered a serious injury if a person requires hospitalization, but the injury is fully reversible. An accident is also to be reported to the FAA within 10 days if there's damage to any property greater than $500 to repair or replace the property, whichever one is lower. Lastly, keep in mind you may be required to recall the following items listed. 60 represents airmen in a given situation. 70 represents airspace. And 90 represents air traffic and general operating rules. 60, 70, and 90 are referenced in advisory circulars issued by the FAA. Basically, the advisory circulars or ACs refer to a type of publication offered by the FAA, including rules and industry standards when it comes to flying safely. When discussing certain topics that may include information about airmen, airspace, and air traffic control, they use the terms 60, 70, and 90 to categorize the information that may be helpful to pilots. Very similar to a table of contents, the information would be categorized by number, when navigating to section 70, you would receive additional insight into airspace. Be sure to review these definitions a few times because you'll be seeing a lot of them on the aeronautical knowledge test. In the next chapter, we'll be discussing responsibilities and best practices of a remote pilot in command. We'll see you there. Since the Federal Aviation Administration's Part 107 ruling came into effect on August 29, 2016, the FAA wants to ensure you demonstrate knowledge in the operating guidelines necessary to understand the process of registration, responsibilities, safe operation, and limitations that are associated with the Part 107 rule. Now let's get started by discussing some responsibilities and best practices of a remote pilot in command. What you'll begin to notice is that flying safely does not only apply when the drone is in the air. There are many responsibilities of a remote PIC prior to flight, such as conducting an assessment of the operating environment to check weather conditions, local airspace restrictions, and making sure that everyone involved has been briefed prior to takeoff. If anything were to happen during a mission, everything falls back on the remote pilot in command. Let's say there was an accident and it was caused by the pilot's inability to check the local airspace before flying a mission. Your remote pilot certificate is what the FAA comes after if there were an investigation into the incident. It definitely isn't something you want to mess around with because the FAA is very strict on how they go about things. Now don't get too caught up on the FAA. We have everything you need to know in this course that will help you understand the rules and regulations as well as some more best practices to keep in mind when flying to keep out of trouble in the future. In addition to ensuring everyone in the vicinity is safe, there are some best practices with regards to your SUAS that will ensure the level of risk is reduced during flight. 
Prior to flight, the remote PIC must ensure the controls are working properly between the control station and the small UA, that there's sufficient power to land properly, that any objects attached are secured properly, and lastly, that all documentation is visible and available for inspection, including the remote pilot certificate and any certificate of waivers. Now, believe it or not, the person manipulating the flight controls does not have to hold a remote pilot certificate. However, if you don't hold a remote pilot certificate, you must be supervised by someone who does hold one. This person must be able to take control of the SUAS immediately during the flight. There are a couple ways you can do this. The one most recommended is a buddy box system that would use two remotes or control stations that would allow for the person holding the remote pilot certificate to override the person manipulating the controls if the situation permits. As I mentioned, remote pilot in command and visual observer or VO are terms that you're going to see very frequently throughout the part 107 exam. To give you some more information about visual observer or VO, it can be described as a person acting as a flight crew member who assists the remote PIC and the person manipulating the controls during a mission to see and avoid potential air traffic or objects in the vicinity of the flight path. Remember, the use of a visual observer is optional. Moving on to a topic you'll likely see on the exam, careless or reckless operations. Part 107 prohibits careless or reckless operations, and it's our job as remote pilots in command to ensure safe flight and to obey the Part 107 regulations that the FAA has provided us with. So with that in mind, flying an SUAS while driving a moving vehicle is considered to be careless or reckless because the person's attention would be hazardously divided. In addition, operations while impaired are also strictly prohibited. This is a question you'll be tested on, so pay close attention here. Part 107 does not allow operation of an SUAS if the remote pilot in command, person manipulating the controls or visual observer is unable to safely carry out their responsibilities. This includes the consumption of any alcoholic beverage within the last eight hours of operation. If you're under the influence of alcohol or if you have a blood alcohol concentration of 0.04% or greater. Additionally, if you're using a drug that affects a person's mental or physical capabilities. That's it for this chapter. We'll see you in the next lecture. Hey everyone, welcome to this lesson on required documentation that you as a remote pilot in command must have when operating under part 107. Whether you're by yourself or heading out to the job site with your team, we're going to make sure you know exactly what legal documents you need to bring along for the ride. First, let's start with what you need to have on you personally as a remote pilot in command. If the FAA were to show up during your operation, you want to make sure you're following all of the Part 107 standards and guidelines necessary to fly safely. The first piece of documentation that's required on site during any mission will be the Part 107 Remote Pilot Certificate. If you haven't figured it out by now, that pilot certificate will be mailed to you in the form of an actual ID similar to your driver's license, which you'll receive once you pass the Part 107 exam at an FAA-approved testing center in your area. If you're worried about finding a testing center in your area, don't be. There are actually over 700 registered testing centers here in the United States, and if you need any assistance, my team and I would be happy to help you find and schedule your exam. Along with that certificate, you must show proof that your aircraft is registered through the FAA's Drone Zone account, which I'll be showing you how to do in a later video. Next, you'll want to make sure you have any necessary waivers or exemptions that might prove to the FAA that you've taken the steps necessary to fly in that specific airspace or at that specific location or time of day, whatever it may be. 
along with legal documents that we just reviewed, which were part 107 certificate, aircraft registration number, which you are now actually required to have showing at all times in plain sight on the exterior of your aircraft. This is a new regulation that came out very recently. And again, like I mentioned, we're constantly updating this course with new information as it's released by the FAA. And lastly, for documentation, you will need the necessary waivers or exemptions that you may be operating under for your mission. Now let's say you do the maintenance and repair of your drone by yourself, or you actually build and manufacture your own custom drones for unique applications. You will need to have documents with you that show the modification or upkeep of the system for normal flight operations. Even if it is small changes to the SUAS that you don't think anyone would notice, you are required to have the maintenance notebook with you during all missions. Speaking of logbooks, the last piece of documentation you will need is an up-to-date flight logbook of your operating minutes and the time that you spent on site or in the air. We have a few suggestions of drone logbooks that you can utilize that have worked pretty well for our team in the past. The reason I recommend some of these options that I'll be including in the notes below this video is because myself and my team here at Altitude University have been flying commercially for the last several years as professional full-time drone pilots, working with real estate developers, construction companies, and agricultural firms here in the United States. And with every mission comes a flight logbook that we've used to track the proficiency of the operations at hand. Now, what should you include in your logbook? Before I answer this question, keep in mind, these drone logbooks are just as much for you and your team as much as they are for the FAA's safety guidelines. This is how you keep track of success in your missions and continue to become a better drone pilot with each flight. So what should you include in your drone logbook? There are a few main things like equipment, battery utilization, payload, airspace, client information, and anything else that would benefit the safety of your operation. I know this seems like a lot of documentation, but we want to make sure that you're operating safely and are covered on all fronts so that you can continue having the coolest job in the world, making money as a professional drone pilot, and we're going to help you get there. We'll see you in the next chapter. Hey everyone, welcome to this chapter on daylight waivers and night operations. In this lesson, we'll be discussing the rules and regulations behind operating your SUAS during or after civil twilight ends. In other words, nighttime operations. Please remember the part 107 regulation prohibits any operation of an SUAS at night, which means that if you're flying your SUAS after civil twilight ends, and before the sun rises, this is prohibited by the FAA. Now, what is civil twilight, you might ask? Evening civil twilight is the period of sunset until 30 minutes after sunset. Morning civil twilight is the period of 30 minutes prior to sunrise up until sunrise. If you're planning on flying during the 30 minute civil twilight period, you must have anti-collision lights on your SUAS that are visible for three statute miles in each direction. If you know you're gonna be operating frequently during this time, I'll include the anti-collision lights that I use in the notes below this video. If you'd like additional information regarding civil twilight, the Air Almanac provides tables which are used to determine sunrise and sunset at various latitudes. You will need a remote pilot certificate to apply for what's called a daylight waiver, which will allow you to fly at night. It sounds contradictory, but that's what the actual waiver is called. So let's say you finish this test prep, pass your exam first try, which we know you will. There's an awesome resource that I've written that'll walk you through the steps necessary in acquiring that daylight waiver. It's over 16 pages of useful information and we've put it together just for you. I'll see you in the next chapter where we'll be discussing visual line of sight operations. We'll see you there.
Hey everyone, this is a quick lesson where you're gonna be learning about visual line of sight operations, maximum operating speed and altitude, and visibility and cloud clearance. The reason we've grouped these learning objectives into one chapter is because they all have some important numbers you'll need to know. Let's get started. Visual line of sight operations can be defined as being able to see the SUAS at all times during flight. Now you may have brief moments in which you cannot see the SUAS, and this is fine, but you must still retain the capability to quickly maneuver it back to visual line of sight. Some examples of situations in which this can occur would be looking at the controller to check battery life, adjusting the control station, or checking the airspace to ensure there are no obstacles approaching directly in the flight path. The part 107 exam will ask you what kind of visibility you'll need to maintain when it comes to cloud clearance requirements. Your minimum visibility cannot be less than three statute miles. You should ensure that you're flying no less than 500 feet below the clouds and no less than 2000 feet horizontally from the clouds. Again, visual line of sight means that you're monitoring the location of your SUAS with vision unaided by any device other than corrective lenses, or in other words, prescription glasses. The only time you'd be allowed assistance would be with the use of binoculars to momentarily enhance your situational awareness. Again, you can only use them momentarily to briefly enhance your vision in a situation that would permit its use. For example, I've used a visual aid in the past to avoid conflict with another aircraft and ensure the flight path is safe for operation and that there are no obstacles in the way. Now moving on, what is the maximum speed and altitude you can operate at? Your drone cannot be flown faster than 100 miles per hour or 87 knots. Most notably, the FAA requires you to fly under 400 feet AGL or above ground level, unless flown within a 400 foot radius of a structure. So what this means is if you're inspecting a windmill, for example, with the height of the windmill being 450 feet tall, you can actually still inspect this structure as long as you're within 400 feet horizontally of the structure and within 400 feet above the structure's uppermost limits. Although this was a short chapter, there's a lot of very important information here that'll be covered on the part 107 exam. Let's quickly review these numbers. The maximum ground speed is 100 miles per hour or 87 knots. When it comes to visibility, you'll need to maintain a minimum visibility of three statute miles and ensure you're flying no less than 500 feet below the clouds and no less than 2000 feet horizontally from the closest group of clouds. Additionally, the FAA strictly regulates the rule that states you must fly under 400 feet AGL unless you're flying within a 400 foot radius of a structure, like I mentioned earlier, or 400 feet above those structures uppermost limits. Now that we've got that covered, I look forward to seeing you in the next lecture where we'll be discussing right of way rules and the regulations around flying over people. We'll see you there. Right of way rules were set in place by the FAA to ensure that no remote pilot in command operates their SUAS in the way of manned aircraft pilots. It's our duty as pilots in command to yield right of way to aircraft, especially in the vicinity of an airport. This can be referred to as see and avoid. If you're operating in class G uncontrolled airspace and you or your visual observer senses an aircraft coming in your general operating area, it's important that you yield right of way and maneuver your SUAS to a safe location while the aircraft passes. Maneuvering your aircraft outside of your planned flight path brings us right into the next topic, which is flying over people. Now, part 107 prohibits the flight of an SUAS directly over individuals who are not under safe cover. And safe cover can be defined as a protective structure or 
a stationary vehicle. You may also note that flying over those involved in the operation is allowed as long as those in the operation are briefed beforehand. Operating over non-participants, however, is a different story. A non-participant can be defined as anyone who is not directly involved in the safety of the mission. You may be wondering what steps you can take to ensure you don't violate this specific regulation, and I'll give you a solution that will lower the risk of having non-participants in the flight path. When planning your mission, you can choose a sparsely populated area that will allow plenty of room for those involved in the mission, and those who aren't involved in the mission can stay clear of the aircraft. The control zone is typically where you take off and where you land, and allows a single location that's known by the crew as the home base. This control zone helps the team make a plan to keep non-participants clear of the takeoff and landing location as well as makes the operational area known so those who aren't involved can predict exactly where the aircraft will be returning to. Additionally, the FAA has included that it's completely legal to operate from a moving vehicle if your operation takes place in a sparsely populated area where proper planning is involved in case a non-participant were to approach. Moving vehicles include cars and boats, but do not include moving aircraft. So to recap, in the small chance you will need to operate from a moving vehicle, it's allowed in sparsely populated areas from a car or a boat, but not an airplane. During these moving vehicle operations, the FAA states that transporting another person's property in return for compensation is prohibited. If your mission requires transporting property or cargo, it should be from a control station with a few things in mind. First thing to keep in mind, the total weight of the SUAS, including the cargo, must remain less than 55 pounds. Second, the SUAS operation must be within the boundaries of a state. You can't cross any borders. And third, you can't attach items that you intend to drop from the drone in a matter that creates a safety or hazard to people or property. Lastly, you cannot operate the SUAS from a moving vehicle or any waterborne vessel if you're transporting cargo. We discussed a few definitions earlier in the chapter and there's one that's actually going to show up as a trick question on your exam. We mentioned that you must register your drone if it has a takeoff weight of greater than 0.55 pounds and less than 55 pounds. It's important to remember that the regulation does not include 55 pounds. Again, 0.55 pounds up to, but not including 55 pounds. We'll see you in the next chapter. Hey everyone, welcome to this chapter on certificates of waivers and the offenses of drugs and alcohol in an SUAS operation. The key here is to understand that these requirements must be obeyed and maintained during the duration of your remote pilot certificate. If you're a remote pilot in command and your mission will not be conducted under the regulatory structure of part 107, it's your job to apply for what's called a Certificate of Waiver from the FAA. This means that you'll be deviating from the rules and regulations under Part 107, and you'd like to request authorization to carry out your mission safely while being exempt from common Part 107 law. The only way that the FAA will grant you this Certificate of Waiver is if you can prove to them that a safe operation can be conducted under the specific terms of your proposed COW. So to recap, make sure that if you need to deviate from the provisions of Part 107, that you can confidently provide the FAA with exactly what you'll be doing and exactly how you plan to do it safely. From there, they'll give you a yes or no answer that will determine if you can move forward with the proposed mission. Now you may be wondering how far in advance you'll need to submit this waiver request to the FAA so that you can plan a date and time for your mission. The answer is at least 90 days before the planned flight. Keep that in mind because this is a common test question. 
The answer, start the waiver process 90 days prior to your mission. Some common waivable sections include operating from a moving vehicle, night operations, VLOS operations, operations in certain airspace in addition to a few others. To finish up here, let's keep in mind that a certificate of waiver with the option to deviate from the provisions in Part 107 is just one of the many benefits that come along with having this remote pilot's license. To continue exercising the privileges of the certificate, you must be sure to pass the recurrent knowledge test every 24 months. So you do have to renew this Part 107 license every two years. I hope you found this updated lesson beneficial and we'll see you in the next chapter. The FAA wants to make it very clear that there is a distinct difference between recreational and commercial pilots. Obviously, if you're taking this Part 107 test prep course, you understand the benefits of holding a remote pilot license and will most likely be operating in return for compensation. But let's take a moment to clarify what makes someone a recreational pilot. If you meet either of these two definitions given to us by the FAA, you can classify yourself as a recreational pilot. First, pursuit outside one's regular occupation, especially for relaxation. And second, a means of refreshment or diversion. As a recreational pilot governed by the AMA or Academy of Model Aeronautics, there are a few guidelines that you must follow. These rules, again, are for hobby or recreation only. The guidelines include registering your model aircraft, making sure that your drone is under 55 pounds, flying within visual line of sight, notifying air traffic control if you're within five miles of an airport, and never flying near other aircrafts. So if you're ever out flying and you see a hobbyist pilot flying recklessly or out of their proposed guidelines, Let's make sure to educate them or provide them with the necessary knowledge to fly safely in the national airspace system. As someone who's taken the time to go through this rigorous course and pass the Part 107 exam to become a remote pilot in command, it's our responsibility to help others in our community and keep the sky safe for our fellow pilots. We'll see you in the next chapter. I'm going to walk you through the process of how to register your drone with the FAA in these simple steps. The FAA requires that all unmanned aircraft greater than 0.55 pounds, again, and less than 55 pounds, be registered with the FAA and given a registration number. You can do this either by registering online, which I'll show you, or by using a paper-based registration process. The first thing you'll want to do is visit the FAA's Drone Zone website, which I'll also link in the notes below the video. You'll create an account here by providing your email and setting up a password. Register your drone as an individual or a business. And once you receive your unique registration number, make sure to print out a label and attach it to the outside of your drone where it's easy to see. Each registration is only $5, so it won't break the bank to be an aerial pilot. As a friendly reminder, you must have the FAA drone registration certificate in your possession when flying, and you are required to show it to any federal, state, or local law enforcement officer. Additionally, if you're selling your drone, be sure to unregister the drone within your FAA drone zone account. Once your drone is registered, you're free to fly under certain regulations, of course. We'll see you in the next chapter. Welcome to the last chapter of this module. Following this video, you'll have access to our chapter quiz that will allow you to test your understanding of the learning objectives we've covered so far. If you have any questions throughout the quiz, please feel free to reach out to our team through the contact form available on our website, and we'd be happy to provide assistance. In this chapter, we'll start by discussing the differences between waivers and authorizations. Let's take a look at when you would use a waiver 
and when you would need an authorization to fly. First, an authorization is something that would allow you to fly in controlled airspace. When we get to the module on controlled airspace and airspace classifications, you'll begin to understand the difference between uncontrolled, where you'll be spending the majority of your time flying, and controlled airspace. Controlled airspace authorizations can be issued for up to six months and are usually easier to acquire than waivers. The reason being, if you're applying for a waiver, you're saying that you want to be treated differently than everyone else flying under Part 107. Whereas authorizations are a simple request to fly in controlled airspace, for example, near your local airport. Authorizations are good up to six months, and then after that you'll need to submit a waiver request. Waivers should be requested up to 90 days prior to the proposed mission and can also be used for long-term airspace authorizations if needed. That's it for this module. Good luck on the quiz, and we'll see you in the next video. Hey everyone, in this chapter we'll be discussing how to appropriately understand METAR and TAF reports. Let's get started. So the first thing to grasp is that METAR stands for Meteorological Terminal Aviation Weather Report and TAF report is a terminal aerodrome forecast. Now these may sound difficult, but to put it into simpler terms, METAR and TAF reports are just concise statements of the expected weather conditions at an airport during a specific period of time. There are three weather briefings that you should get to know before flying. The first one is a standard briefing, which should be obtained before every flight. The second is an abbreviated briefing, which should be requested when a departure is delayed. And the final one is an outlook briefing, which should be requested when a departure is six hours away. Weather reports are vital in assessing the safety of any UA mission prior to flight. Let's review a METAR report. METAR is a routine weather report issued to understand the current weather that's observed at an airport during a specific time. METARs can be challenging to read, so take your time and really understand the sequential order of how the information is reported. What we're going to do is walk you through step by step of understanding an actual METAR report from left to right. Let's start with number one on the far left hand side here, which is going to tell you the type of report. There are two types of reports. There's a METAR report, which is updated on an hourly basis. And then there's a SPECI report, which can be issued at any time to update the METAR report on any critical weather conditions that may be taking place. So to review number one, you're going to see the type of report as METAR or SPECI. Moving to the right, number two is your station identifier or airport identifier, which is given through a four letter code. This four letter code has a unique three letter airport identifier that comes after the letter K. This three letter code is established by the International Civil Aviation Organization or ICAO. For example, Gainesville Regional Airport in Gainesville, Florida is identified by the letters K, G and V, K being the country designation and G and V being the airport identifier. The letter K applies to the 48 states within the United States, discluding Alaska and Hawaii. These two regions actually have their own unique country designation. Alaska's is PA, followed by the three letter airport identifier, and Hawaii can be found under PH, followed by the three letter airport identifier. Moving on to number three, which is the date and time of the METAR report put into a six digit group. The first two digits are the date and the last four digits are the time of the METAR report, which is given in a universal time like UTC. Now the Z is appended to the end to denote the time is given in Zulu time as opposed to local time. Once you know the universal time, you can then use any online conversion tool to put this into local time if necessary. 
Now, number four is the station modifier, which will tell you whether the METAR report came from an automated source, which would be shown in the format AUTO. And then there's the potential that the METAR report came from a corrected report, which would be shown in the format COR. A corrected report is usually sent out to correct a mistake that was published in a prior report. Number five is going to have your win data. This is usually reported with five digits, unless the speed is greater than 99 knots, to which it becomes six digits. The first three digits indicate the direction from which the wind is blowing in relation to true north. After those first three numbers, you're going to see the type of wind you're working with. For example, if the wind is variable, you'll see VRB after the numbers. Now if the winds are gusting, you'll see the letter G, with the last two digits showing the highest expected speed of those wind gusts. So if you see G35, the wind gusts will be expected to hit 35 knots. Moving on to the right, number six on this META report, we have visibility. Visibility is reported in statute miles, or SM, which can either be in the form of a whole number or a fraction. If it's a whole number represented, let's say, as 3SM, that's going to be 3 statute miles. If it's represented as 1 half, that's going to be 1 half of a statute mile. This is an easy one because all you have to do is remember either whole numbers or fractions of the visibility in statute miles. Moving on to number seven, we have weather. Now there are a few parts to the weather section that I want to make sure you understand, starting with the intensity, which will be shown either in the front as a minus sign for light intensity, nothing for moderate intensity, or it can be shown as a plus sign for heavy intensity. The second part of the weather section following the intensity is the weather phenomena in the area. If there's a TSRA, this depicts thunderstorms represented by the TS and heavy rain represented by that RA there. So TSRA. And finally, the last part is the descriptor, which can show haze, rain, or even snow. Number eight, we have sky condition or cloud cover. The first set of letters represents the status of the cloud cover. For example, BKN stands for broken. In other words, a broken cloud cover. The three digit set of numbers that follows represents the height of the cloud base in hundreds of feet AGL. So in this case, BKN009 is a broken cloud cover at 009 or 900 feet above ground level. So the height of the cloud base is at 900 feet. That's the first half. Let's take a look at the second half here. That OVC represents an overcast cloud. For example, 011 following it showing overcast clouds at 1100 feet AGL. The last indicator is CB, which will give you an idea of the type of cloud. For example, in this case, CB is a cumulonimbus cloud. So again, this section is going to give you a really good idea of the sky condition in a certain area. Number nine, temperature and dew point. The air temperature and dew point are always given in whole degrees Celsius, or 26 over 25, which would be a temperature of 26 degrees Celsius and a dew point of 25 degrees Celsius. Temperatures below zero degrees Celsius are preceded by the letter M to indicate minus. Number 10, we have altimeter setting. If you were a manned aircraft pilot, this information would apply more directly to in-flight operations that are necessary to set the altimeter pressure. So 2985 means you would set your altimeter pressure to 29.85 inches of mercury. This is a four-digit number group, A2985, and it's always preceded by the letter A. So starting with A and then that four-digit group. 
And lastly, number 11, which is for remarks. So the remarks section always begins with the letters RMK, to which comments may or may not appear in the section of the METAR. The information contained in this section may include wind data, variable visibility, beginning and ending times of particular phenomena, pressure information, and other various information deemed necessary. So let's review this one more time from start to finish. Hey everyone, so now we're going to review a METAR report example for you. This METAR is from Chicago Midway Airport, which you can tell by the airport identifier, which is K, followed by MDW, or Midway Airport. This was issued on the 4th, which is the day, and then the following four digits are the time, which is 1852 hours Zulu time. The wind direction is at 120 degrees at 0, 08 or 8 knots. There's six statute miles of visibility with light rain, that's the minus sign RA, scattered clouds at 600 feet, broken clouds at 4,700 feet, and overcast clouds at 11,000 feet. Then you can see we have 21 over 19, which means the temperature was 21 degrees Celsius and the dew point was 19 degrees Celsius. And the altimeter setting, the altimeter is at 2981, which means that the pilot should set the altimeter to 29.81 inches of mercury. And lastly, we end this METAR report with a remarks section. So if this is something you've just seen for the first time, I would recommend pausing the video here to take a closer look at the chart before moving on to the next section where we'll be discussing TAF reports. They're not as long as METAR reports, so don't worry. We'll see you in the next lecture. Welcome to this chapter on TAF reports. Now, a Terminal Aerodrome Forecast, or TAF, is a weather report established for the five statute mile radius around an airport. Something to remember, TAF reports are usually given for larger airports, and they're only updated four times a day as opposed to the METAR reports that are issued every hour. A TAF is usually valid for a 24-hour or 30-hour time period, but the validity will vary and is always indicated from within the report, which we'll cover in just a bit here. The TAF report is set up the same way as the METAR report, using abbreviations as descriptors in the following sequential order. First, we have the type of report, which can be either a routine forecast or an amended forecast, shown as either TAF or TAF-AMD for amended. Second, we have the station identifier for the airport, which is the same four-letter identifier that's used in the METAR report, starting with K. Third, date and time, which is given to us in a six-digit number code, with the first two being the date and the last four being the time, exactly the same as that METAR report. Next, we have something that is unique to the TAF report, which is the valid period. It's an eight-digit number, with the first two being the day of the month. The next two are the starting hour. The next two are the day. And the last two are the ending hour. And lastly, forecast conditions, which is the body of the TAF here, similar to the METAR, with wind, visibility, weather, and sky conditions. Now, this next part has an example of what a TAF report might look like. Let's walk through this from left to right. Hey everyone, so now we're going to review a TAF report, which as you can see is very similar to a METAR report, starting with K as the airport identifier, followed by MDW, standing for Midway Airport. This TAF report was issued on the 4th, which is the day, at 1744 hours Zulu time, and is valid from the 4th at 1800 hours Zulu until the next day, the 5th at 1800 hours Zulu. So for 24 hours, this TAF report is valid. 
Next, we'll have wind direction. We can expect 220 degrees at eight knots with six statute miles visibility. And again, that minus sign will represent the light rain. In the vicinity, we can expect thunder showers with scattered clouds at 600 feet. And those will be cumulonimbus clouds with CB at the end. In addition, we have broken clouds at 4,700 feet and overcast at 1,100 feet. Now, temporarily on the 4th at 1,800 hours Zulu time until later that day on the 4th at 2,000 hours Zulu, the visibility will be four statute miles with rain showers broken at 800 feet. From the 4th at 2100 hours Zulu time, the wind direction will be 240 degrees at 9 knots, plus we have 5 statute miles of visibility. In the vicinity, there will be some rain showers. We have scattered clouds at 1000 feet, broken clouds at 2500 feet, and overcast at 6000 feet. From the 5th at midnight Zulu time, we have wind at 270 degrees at 8 knots. We'll have 6 statute miles visibility with scattered clouds at 2,500 feet as well as broken at 6,000 feet. Then on the 5th, starting at 0,300 hours or 3 a.m. Zulu, we'll have wind direction 300 degrees at 10 knots with six statute miles visibility. In addition, scattered clouds at 2,500 feet and broken clouds at 6,000 feet. Next, from the 5th at 6 a.m. Zulu or 0,600 hours, we'll have winds coming from 320 degrees at eight knots. We'll have six statute miles visibility, few clouds, 2,500 feet, scattered clouds at 6,000 feet. Then from the 5th at 1,400 hours Zulu or 10 a.m. local time, we'll have wind direction 340 degrees at 12 knots, plus six statute miles of visibility and scattered clouds at 6,000 feet. Be sure to test yourself on this TAF report and then check the explanation in the text below for the correct answer. We'll see you in the next chapter. We started the last chapter by introducing the standard, abbreviated, and Outlook weather briefings, which are the three most common ways to obtain weather information before flying a mission. If you need a quick refresher here, standard briefings should be obtained before every flight. Abbreviated briefings should be requested when a departure is delayed. And Outlook briefings, which should be requested when a departure is six hours away. Now, if you're interested in flying complex missions as a professional drone pilot, I wanted to quickly introduce what's called the flight service station. It's a number that you can call that will allow you to talk to a weather specialist and obtain NOTAMs, which are notices to airmen, and TFRs, or temporary flight restrictions that may be in the area. The number is 1-800-WX-BRIEF, and I would recommend getting their insight into what you're trying to accomplish in your mission. Now this next tool I'm going to show you should be used for flight planning purposes only and should be used in combination with ceiling and visibility information from official sources such as METAR and TAF reports like we just discussed. But if you're wondering what you can do as a remote pilot in command to ensure you're doing everything you can to safely prepare for a flight at an unfamiliar location, I would recommend utilizing the Aviation Weather Center's website where you can find tools like the HEMS tool or Helicopter Emergency Medical Services tool. To give you an idea of what a tool like this would be used for, Think about low flying aircrafts and how they have to maneuver at low altitude during an emergency. What would allow them to determine whether a mission would be safe or not to move forward with? Aviationweather.gov built out the HEMS tool, which shows you weather patterns at low altitude. 
Now, even though this tool wasn't developed specifically for remote pilots in command, it can be used as a tool to determine whether a mission is safe to fly or not. We'll see you in the next chapter. In this chapter, we'll be discussing the outside effects that weather can have on the flight of a small unmanned aircraft, as well as some weather conditions to be aware of when planning your mission. Remember, this module on weather effects takes up between 11 to 16% of the exam. Before we start, I wanted to quickly review MSL versus AGL, or mean sea level versus above ground level. Airport elevations are given to you in MSL, and depending on where you're located in the United States, mean sea level and your elevation at ground level where you're standing may be very different. The reason for this is simple. If you're thinking about flying your drone and you're located in Denver, Colorado, this will not affect your ability to fly when taking into consideration the 400 foot AGL rule. Meaning, if you're already at 5,280 feet MSL, you can still fly up to 400 feet AGL. That's why it's very important to know the difference between mean sea level and above ground level. So just a reminder, all airspace is given to us in MSL. When discussing weather conditions, you may hear the term absolute altitude which is just another way to describe the altitude or height of something that's starting at ground level. Now that we got that covered, let's get right into it. So density altitude can be described as the altitude relative to the standard atmosphere conditions at which the air density would equal the air density at the place of observation. This is a pretty complex definition given out by the FAA, so let's take a moment to break this down further. When I think of density altitude, I directly relate it to the density of air at a certain elevation and how the aircraft would perform at that height. Let me explain. So when your drone is up in the air, it's using its propellers or wings to grab onto the air. And if you're at a higher elevation like the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, your drone is going to be working harder to grab onto the thin air that's at that altitude. This changes at different atmospheric conditions. Be aware that higher density altitude results in thinner air, and low density altitude results in denser air. So in other words, at higher altitudes, the molecules spread out, and it's harder for the propellers to grab on to the thin air that would lift the aircraft. Higher density altitude occurs at higher elevations like the cold, rocky mountains of Colorado, leading to reduced performance because of the thinner air. And at lower density altitude, higher temperatures and higher humidity lead to better performance due to the dense air that's in that region. So just a quick recap on aircraft performance. When there's a change in an aircraft's weight, it produces a twofold effect on climb performance. An increase in altitude also increases the power required, and vice versa. Therefore, the climb performance of an aircraft actually diminishes with altitude. Now there is a such thing as wind obstructions, which as a remote pilot in command is very important to be aware of. Obstructions on the ground affect the flow of wind and can be an unseen danger. Ground topography and large buildings can break up the flow of wind and create wind gusts that can change rapidly in speed and direction. Let's go through an example. If you were to take a look at the topography of land that had rough gravel, rocks, or sand covering the ground, this area would typically give off a large amount of heat in that region. If you were to take a look at an area with watered vegetation like trees and tall plants, this area would typically absorb and retain the heat in that specific region. Different regions have different surfaces, and these surfaces create uneven circulation as the air transfers over that region. This is called convective currents. Let's talk about the different ways a small unmanned aircraft can be affected while flying over various regions with differing surface topography. 
If you're flying over that rocky gravel region on a warm summer day, you're typically going to experience updrafts that shift the flight of your drone. If you're looking to fly at low altitudes over a large body of water like a lake with cool expansive areas, be sure to know that you're likely to experience downdrafts in that region. This is especially true when you're flying over an ocean, which brings us to the next point, which is a sea breeze. A sea breeze can be described by the way warm, dense air over land heats up and rises, only to be circulated and replaced by the cool air that's brought in from the flowing wind over the ocean. This circulation pattern is called a sea breeze and can be described in the opposite fashion when it comes to nighttime. As the sun sets, the sea breeze reverses. Now what we'll begin to see is the land cool down faster than the water at night, which means the cool wind over the land circulates through an offshore wind, pushing it out to sea with the goal of replacing the warm air over the water that will eventually rise and get replaced. In addition to wind obstructions, flying in mountainous regions can be just as dangerous. When you're flying in areas with high mountain peaks, it's very important to gather as much pre-flight information as possible. While the wind flows smoothly up one side of the mountain, the upward currents help to carry an aircraft over the peak of the mountain. However, the wind on the leeward side does not act in a similar manner. As the air flows down, it follows the contour of the terrain, leading to increased turbulence. This tends to push an aircraft into the side of a mountain. The stronger the wind, the greater the downward pressure and the turbulence become. Speaking of wind speed and direction changing rapidly, wind shear is a weather condition to be very aware of. It's a drastic change in speed and direction over a small area, which means that it's more abrupt and more violent in some scenarios. Wind shear is dangerous to an aircraft. For example, a tailwind can quickly change to a headwind, causing an unexpected increase in airspeed and performance. This chapter discusses many examples of weather effects, but microbursts can be defined as the most severe type of wind shear. If you ever encounter a microburst, your drone could experience performance increasing headwinds followed by performance decreasing downdrafts, all within a distance of less than a mile. When this happens, it can actually produce dangerously low to the ground flight and it can affect the safety of your mission. So watch out for those inadvertent microburst encounters. With that said, let's talk about how you can identify a microburst. A typical microburst has a horizontal diameter of one to two miles, a nominal depth of 1,000 feet, a lifespan of five to 15 minutes, down drafts up to 6,000 feet per minute, and headwind losses of 30 to 90 knots. Again, that's just how you can identify it. Now, don't get too caught up on the numbers, but microbursts are actually important to identify, so make sure you understand the negative impacts that microbursts have on flight. Remember, microbursts are so dangerous because they occur in relatively small areas and can be an unforeseen danger to remote pilots. We'll see you in the next chapter. Hey everyone, let's start with a review of moisture. Water can be found in the atmosphere in three states, liquid, solid, or gas. If you remember all the way back to elementary school, as water changes from one form to another, there's an exchange of heat. Those changes boil down to evaporation, sublimation, condensation, deposition, melting, and freezing. The two that we'll be focusing on are evaporation and sublimation. Be sure to make some notes on these two definitions, as well as the six different types of fog we'll be exploring here in a second. Evaporation is the process that occurs when liquid water is turned to liquid vapor. Sublimation is the process that occurs when ice is turned into water vapor. If you've ever played with dry ice, this is the case here. There are six main types of fog, however, 
we'll only be discussing the four types that are going to show up on your knowledge test. The first one is called radiation fog, which ultimately takes place after a long day of the sun heating up the ground. As the cool evening air comes around, that hot surface radiates heat upwards towards the crisp air, and the outcome is called radiation fog. The environment has to be very calm in order for this type of fog to exist. Once you get a small breeze involved, it will immediately clear out the air. The next topic of discussion is advection fog, which you'd be familiar with if you happen to live near the ocean. As warm, moist air moves sideways across the surface towards a large body of cool water, its temperature drops and the interaction that takes place creates fog. If you live on the beach, you've seen this take place as the warm air moves across the sand towards the cool morning water and it creates a layer of advection fog right over the surface. As temperature and dew point converge, fog is created. Sometimes it's hard to picture how fog would form, but in the case of upslope fog, moist air flows towards a slope, and as the air rises with the terrain, it cools the air on the slope and condensation occurs. Upslope fog needs a little wind to help push the warm, moist air up the mountain as it moves up in altitude, and it cools down and condenses right into fog. If you live in Colorado, you'll likely see upslope fog, which is common actually in the Rocky Mountains. The last type of fog you'll need to know for the knowledge test is called precipitation-induced fog, otherwise known as steam fog. This typically happens during the summertime, when the ground has been heated by the sun all day, and there's a slight shower of precipitation that when it hits the hot ground, immediately turns into steam, which is why it's otherwise known as steam fog. So if you see precipitation-induced fog on your exam, think precipitation as in rain, and how the rain hits the hot surface, causing the steam reaction to occur. That's it for this chapter. We'll see you in the next video. Hey everyone, welcome to this chapter on the three main cloud formations you'll have to identify as a remote pilot in command. Let's start with low-level clouds, which are classified as 6,500 feet and below. Anything above 6,500 feet extending into the middle and high cloud range aren't going to be applicable to UAS pilots, due to the fact that you won't be flying in that region because of height restrictions. Low clouds encompass two main cloud types, which are stratus clouds and cumulus clouds that may be indicators for the weather. Cumulus clouds are white fluffy clouds that are scattered throughout the sky. If you see these fair weather clouds, it could be a great day to have a picnic. In Latin, cumulus actually means heap, and the reason for that is because these cloud types usually build vertically, getting thicker and thicker as they extend upwards. As these clouds grow, you might see some precipitation alongside thunderstorms, which is when you want to add the suffix nimbus, which means rain. So cumulonimbus clouds are strong vertical clouds with precipitation. Next up, we have stratus clouds, which aren't as exciting as cumulus clouds. Stratus clouds are typically dismal clouds that fill the sky with a layer of dark cover. In Latin, stratus means layer and can be seen as a gloomy blanket that might bring precipitation at that low cloud level. Keep in mind, you'll only need to know low level clouds when flying your SUAS, but you might see a few weather questions that incorporate high level clouds, which are 20,000 feet and above called cirrus clouds. Cirrus clouds are wispy, thin clouds that mainly indicate that a change in weather is about to happen. You've probably seen these thin clouds if you ever look up on a clear day, perhaps during a hike. That's it for this chapter, and we'll see you in the next video. Hey everyone! In the last chapter, we discussed cumulus clouds, which when the suffix nimbus is added, becomes a dense vertical 
towering rain cloud that's commonly associated with instability in the atmosphere and thunderstorms. They're usually the most dangerous cloud type due to the fact that they can produce lightning and severe tornadoes. Let's talk about the different stages of a thunderstorm and the danger it can pose to a remote pilot in command. There are three stages to a thunderstorm, the cumulus stage, the mature stage, and the dissipating stage. The first stage of a thunderstorm is the cumulus stage. The cumulus stage produces strong updrafts and the cloud growth rate can actually exceed 3,000 feet per minute. As you can probably gather, it would be unwise to operate your SUAS in these conditions. The second stage of a thunderstorm is the mature stage which is the most intense stage of a thunderstorm. Keep that in mind for your exam. The precipitation indicates strong downdrafts, which can exceed 2,500 feet per minute. Very important that you remember all thunderstorms reach their greatest intensity during the mature stage. The third and final stage of a thunderstorm is when the downdrafts actually force the storm to die rapidly. Once the downdrafts and rain have ended, the storm is complete. I've talked to many professionals in the industry and they don't recommend operating your drone within a 20 nautical mile radius of a thunderstorm. Now for aviation purposes, let's discuss ceilings and visibility. The lowest layer of clouds is called a ceiling and they can be reported in two ways, either as broken or overcast. If you remember from the previous chapter on METAR and TAF reports, you'll be able to find the current information on ceilings from the automated weather stations. Closely related to the topics of ceilings and cloud cover, you have visibility, which refers to the greatest horizontal distance that certain objects can be viewed with the naked eye. If you'd like to obtain more information on visibility at a specific location, make sure to check out those METAR reports or visit 1-800-WXBRIEF.COM We'll see you in the next chapter. Hey everyone, welcome to this chapter on the main differences between stable and unstable air masses. These topics are guaranteed to be on your Part 107 exam. Let's first discuss stable air masses, which are the types of conditions that we as remote pilots in command are gonna to wanna to fly in. The first question on your exam revolving around this topic will be, what is a characteristic of a stable air mass? Well, let's discuss. Stable air masses usually are very consistent with their conditions. You'll see stratiform clouds, which are nice, smooth, low flying clouds with no vertical development. By vertical development, I mean you won't see a thick, heavy cloud from top to bottom. These stratiform clouds are usually very thin. Inside the stratiform clouds, you'll have low visibility, which is one of its most common characteristics. Think about fog here. In order to have fog, there typically won't be too much unsettling wind. It usually just sits there. If you've ever been on the freeway driving to work in the morning, there's a high chance you are looking at a stratiform cloud, which as you know, has very poor visibility. The last characteristic of stable air is continuous precipitation, where the key word is continuous. Think about the environment when it rains at a slow and steady rate. There usually aren't any crazy clouds producing stable precipitation which is why it's a characteristic of stable air masses. Moving on to unstable air, which will typically produce cumulus clouds. Now, as we mentioned, these are big white puffy clouds that build vertically in the air. Updraft and heat usually helps them build vertically in size and they'll have showery precipitation and there's nothing consistent about it. Believe it or not, unstable air actually produces good visibility because the wind direction is constantly changing. A good example scenario to help you visualize unstable air masses would be in the afternoon thunderstorms, perhaps in the summer heat. That's it for this chapter. We'll see you in the next module.
In order to pass the Airman Knowledge Test to become a remote pilot in command, you'll need to demonstrate knowledge that you understand the airspace classification system. The sky is broken up into six basic classifications of airspace. We have Class A airspace, Class B, Class C, D, E, and Class G airspace. In addition, there are several types of special use airspace set aside for the military to use or for national security. Often UAS operations occur in uncontrolled airspace, which is Class G airspace, and you won't need clearance from anyone before you go flying. However, you need to be able to identify all the different classes of airspace so that you know if you'll need permission or not. You can find the current authorization process on the website www.faa.gov UAS. Generally, airspace is given a classification depending on what happens inside of it. The airspace over a busy airport is tightly controlled, but over sparsely populated rural areas, it's typically uncontrolled. If the military is going to use a specific part of the sky for its pilots to practice, let's say, aerial dogfighting, it'll be designated for that purpose and everyone else is expected to keep out. Of the six general airspace classifications, A, B, C, D, and E are controlled airspace. As a UAS pilot, you need clearance from the FAA or from air traffic control before flying. Class G airspace is uncontrolled, meaning you can fly without permission from anyone. In addition to the different airspace classifications, there are several types of special use airspace that are typically set aside for the military to use or to safeguard national security. These include prohibited, restricted, warning, and military operations areas, among others. Let's start with controlled airspace. Remember, to fly in any of these types of airspace, you'll need permission from the FAA or from air traffic control to fly. Class A airspace exists exclusively at high altitude, meaning 18,000 feet MSL and above. Operations in Class A airspace are prohibited under Part 107, but that doesn't matter for UAS pilots because we never fly that high anyway. Class B airspace surrounds the nation's busiest airports, such as New York, Atlanta, Las Vegas, and Seattle. Typically, Class B airspace extends from the surface to 10,000 feet above the airport that it serves. However, not all Class B airspace actually touches the ground. Think of Class B airspace like an upside-down wedding cake. As you go higher and higher, it gets bigger and bigger. Pilots refer to those overhead tiers of airspace as shelves. Those shelves hang out over other types of airspace underneath, including Class G airspace, where UAS pilots can fly without permission. Now, Class C airspace surrounds major airports that aren't quite as busy as the airports in Class B airspace. Class C airports include Oakland, Fort Lauderdale, Orlando, and Chicago Midway. As a general rule, Class C airspace usually consists of a five nautical mile radius that extends from the surface up to 4,000 feet above the airport elevation, and a 10 nautical mile radius that extends no lower than 1,200 feet up to 4,000 feet above the airport's elevation. The normal radius of an outer area is 20 nautical miles, which means the top shelf of Class C airspace is 10 nautical miles from the airport in the middle to the outer ring, extending in both directions. Like Class B airspace, it also has an upside-down wedding cake configuration with shelves of Class C airspace at altitude that hang out over other types of airspace below it. Class D airspace surrounds smaller regional airports that may not have a full-time control tower. There aren't any shelves in Class D airspace. In fact, it's basically a cylinder sitting on the surface of the earth that goes straight up to its ceiling, typically 2,500 feet above the airport. Class E airspace encompasses most of the airspace below Class A airspace, up to 
but not including 18,000 feet mean sea level. Class E is everything that's left over once you account for Class B airspace, Class C, D, and Class G airspace. Class E only touches the ground in one specific circumstance, at an airport with an instrument approach system that does not have a control tower. Remember, Class B, Class C, D, and E airspace are all controlled airspace, meaning you must get clearance from the FAA or from air traffic control before operating an SUAS in any of these classifications. Now let's talk about Class G airspace, which is uncontrolled. That means you as an SUAS pilot can fly here without clearance. Class G airspace extends from the surface up to the Class E airspace above either 700 feet or 1,200 feet above ground level. UAS pilots are limited to a maximum altitude of 400 feet above ground level, which means you can fly up to that limit anywhere that isn't Class B, Class C, Class D, or Class E airspace. That's a lot of sky that you have available to you. We'll see you in the next chapter. Hey everyone, let's take a look at the different kinds of special use airspace. We have prohibited, restricted, warning, and military operations areas, as well as alert areas, controlled firing areas, and national security areas. Now, as the name suggests, all flight operations are prohibited in prohibited areas. The governing agency could technically give you permission to fly in a prohibited area, but from my experience, that's probably not going to happen. Prohibited airspace protects our most sensitive national assets, such as the National Mall in Washington, D.C., where the White House and the Capitol Building are located. If you were to see a prohibited area on a sectional chart, it would be identified by its blue hash marks. We'll be discussing how to read a sectional chart in a later lesson, but for now I want you to be familiar with the characteristics of these special use airspaces so that you have a general understanding of them by the time we get to the next chapter. Prohibited areas will be shown in blue hash marks, typically with the letter P followed by a number. So for example, if you see P30, which is prohibited 30, on a sectional chart, you won't be able to fly. It's prohibited to all aircrafts and it's a super easy way to lose your remote pilot certificate. Restricted airspace has been set aside for the military to conduct training operations and testing that would be enormously hazardous to any aircraft that isn't part of the exercise. Think live fire artillery drills and guided missile testing. It's in your best interest to stay away from these restricted areas. If for some reason you are interested in seeking permission to fly, you'll need to contact the military that controls the airspace and determine whether the location is what's called hot or cold. If they respond saying the airspace is hot, which means it's currently in use for operation, there is no chance you're going to get authorization to fly. If they respond saying it's cold, just make sure to work with them, go through the proper authorization process, with their permission of course. This restricted airspace will also be shown by blue hash marks on a sectional chart. And if you're wondering how you'll be able to differentiate a restricted area from the previously discussed prohibited area, it's very easy. The restricted area will have an R followed by some numbers within the blue hash marks. And the prohibited area will be intensified by a P followed by some numbers in those hash marks. Warning areas are very similar in nature to restricted areas. However, the United States government does not have sole jurisdiction over the airspace in question, such as out over international waters. In the case of warning areas, you'll typically see them off the coast showing a W followed by a few numbers and representing low flying aircrafts. Keep in mind, this is still Class G, uncontrolled airspace, so you are still able to fly from, let's say, a boat. Just keep in mind, there may be other aircrafts in the area. Military Operations Areas, called MOAs for short. They're pieces of the sky that have been set aside for military training. 
Think of MOAs like a light bulb. They can either be on or off. If you were to see an MOA on a sectional chart, it could be identified by magenta hash marks, and a remote pilot in command would need to exercise extreme caution in this region. When an MOA is active, it is possible to get permission from air traffic control to fly in the affected airspace. However, there's no guarantee you'll be given clearance, and you could just as easily be denied permission. In an alert area, you would expect to find a high volume of pilot training or unusual aerial activity. You are permitted to fly in an alert area, however, you should maintain a high degree of awareness of your surroundings. Expect the unexpected. Controlled firing areas, also known as CFAs, may include activities similar to restricted areas. Weapons training and testing, for example. The difference between the two is that the agency operating the CFA must keep watch for outside aircrafts and immediately suspend operations if one is spotted. National security areas, or NSAs for short, define a block of airspace above sensitive facilities such as munition dumps or submarine bases. Each NSA is marked with a block of text, specifying the altitude above the facility that pilots should maintain. Compliance with NSA advisories is voluntary, but especially as a SUAS pilot, you would be well advised to avoid them. We'll see you in the next chapter. When a remote pilot is planning an operation in the vicinity of an airport, it's important to review the current data for that airport. In the last module, we spoke about METAR and TAF reports, which provide weather data, and this is very similar. The main difference is that NOTAMs and TFRs refer to airport data that you would obtain before a mission. A remote pilot in command can use a NOTAM or Notice to Airmen to help make an informed decision about where and when to operate their small UA. Prior to any flight, pilots should always check for any NOTAMs that could affect their intended flight path. The two best ways to search for NOTAMs would be at 1-800-WXBRIEF.COM, which we mentioned earlier in the course as a trusted site for weather reports or you can check the FAA's official website, which provides in-depth notices to airmen. The chart supplement is also a great place to obtain information on airports, heliports, and seaplane bases that are open to the public. It's published in seven books, which are organized by region and revised every 56 days, so a great source for information. There are plenty of other ways to acquire this information through apps that I'll include in the description below. Let's say AirMap or Skyward, for example. Temporary flight restrictions, or TFRs, prohibit aircraft from operating in a specified area for a period of time. TFRs are posted via notices to airmen, which is why it's always vitally important to check your NOTAMs before flying. There are several reasons that a TFR can be issued. Let's say a visit by the president or vice president, a major sporting event or concert, wildfires or other natural disasters. If a TFR is in effect, you are prohibited from flying unless you have a specific permission from the agency that has requested it. That's it for this video. We'll see you in the next chapter.